Laughter has been sometimes described as a universal language. While there do exist stereotypes of Americans not understanding irony, the British finding men dressed in women's clothing substantially more humorous than it really is, and Germans being completely mirthless creatures, devoid of the ability to experience the joy of laughter altogether, in truth, human beings from all walks of life know funny when they see it. Because laughter releases endorphins in the brain, people regularly seek out experiences that will trigger the reaction, and this demand has made comedy a particularly lucrative subset of the entertainment industry. In stand-up, a performer will stand on stage with a microphone, typically handheld, and attempt to solicit laughter from the audience. And that's it. While this comedy genre is wildly popular across the globe and has elevated a handful of performers to fame, adulation, and wealth, its roar, stripped-back nature makes it notoriously difficult to master. Stand-up comedians almost invariably need to spend years slogging away, performing for no pay or table scraps, before cultivating a level of skill where they can earn any kind of discernible income from the discipline. A tiny minority of those who venture into stand-up will ever be able to make a living off of it, and only the absolute elite talents in the field will find fame and fortune from it. Though occasionally, someone falls through the cracks. Dennis Leary began making a name for himself in the early 90s Boston comedy scene and had his breakout moment with a special entitled No Cure for Cancer that was released on January 12th of 1993. While it was a commercial success, getting significant play in the U.S., the U.K., and Canada, and propelling Leary to newfound notoriety, many people familiar with one of Leary's contemporaries, Bill Hicks, noticed striking similarities between Leary and Hicks' material. The fact that we live in a world where John Lennon was murdered, yet Barry Manilow continues to put out albums. Oh, uh, yeah. Kill somebody, have some fucking taste. I'll drive you to Kenny Rogers' house. Get in the car, I know where Wham lives. You gotta have faith. No, George, you gotta have talent, dude. New rule. All these rock stars should have been killed, man. Every single goddamn one of them. Right after John Lennon died, we should have gotten the Partridge family bus and driven around and killed them all one by one, you know? We live in a country where John Lennon takes six bullets in the chest. Yoko Ono was standing right next to him. Not one fucking bullet. Explain that to me. Explain it to me, God. Explain it to me, God. I want it. Explain it to me, God. While Leary has always maintained his innocence of joke thievery, the phenomenon of parallel thinking can never be ruled out, and the extent of Leary's alleged plagiarism pales in comparison to joke thieves that would come after him, his perceived transgressions against one of the art form's all-time greats has left a permanent stain on his reputation within the stand-up comedy scene. Leary put out only one more special, Lock and Load, three years after Hicks' untimely death, and has since focused his efforts toward film and television. This second phase of his career proved to be largely successful, and though that success can be largely attributed to Larry's own good looks and passable enough acting talent, it would be understandable for some to still feel a sense of injustice that he was able to attain the success off of the back of stand-up comedy that even if not plagiarized, still relied primarily on over-delivery, obnoxious facial expressions, and shouting. Well, yeah, Bill, I've got some cigarettes. Holy shit! These things are bad for you! Shit, I thought they were good for you. I thought they had vitamin C in them and stuff. I bet you get a tumor as soon as you light up. You'll never get me, copper. I'm never coming out, see? I got a cigarette machine right here in my bedroom. Yeah, see? Yeah. I'm going to get one of those tracheotomies so I can smoke two cigarettes at the same time. Oh! Damn it, you dog like that. Sure, it's scary, but you can make a lot of money with a voice box. Get a voice box, walk around the streets of Manhattan. You got any spare change? Here's my whole wallet. Get away from me. Ah! <laughs> Judas Priest on trial because my kid wrote the record and he listened to the lyrics and he got into Satan. <laughs> yes, Dennis Leary is undoubtedly a hack comedian. And though hack comedians may not be respected by their peers, in all areas of the entertainment industry, status rules over all. And no matter how insufferable any given individual may be, if they're the most famous and connected person in a room at any given moment, no one will call them on their bullshit.
It was likely this very social norm that Leary was relying on when on May 7th of 2003, he made an appearance on Comedy Central's Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn and acted like a talentless, surly, thin-skinned douchebag from beginning to end. But unfortunately for Leary, on this occasion, one of the panelists would not be as accommodating as he had become accustomed to. (laughs) Okay, North Korea... North Korea. Some people think it's funny, but, uh, Dennis, what do you think? Should we go in there now? They're starting with us. What should we do? <laughs> Let's go in. Let's go in. Let's get the, uh, what does he drink? Kovacier. Yeah, he's like the biggest customer Kovacier has on the yes, planet. Yes, he is. I think they ship, like, some insane, like, a million bottles to him. Right. Every time they, they, come, they do a batch on a yearly basis, they send it to him. Let's go over, get drunk, kick the shit out of him, come back. The segment gets off to a decent start, with host Colin Quinn inviting Leary to riff on the prospect of invading North Korea, demonstrating an understanding of the comedic concept Yes And, where one comic will accept a proposition that's given to them by another and then build on it. Leary's edition builds on North Korea's then-dear leader Kim Jong-il's known penchant for the cognac Corvorsier, suggesting the U.S. could use the invasion as an opportunity to tie one on while overthrowing the brutal regime. While certainly not the stylings of a comedic genius, the play is perfectly adequate for cable TV banter. However, despite the surface-level appearance of a smooth segment, subtle signs of the pettiness and insecurity that Leary will exhibit far more brazenly later on already begin to make an appearance. And then next, why don't we just poison the Cavassier, save us the trip? (laughs) I'm just saying, that's a good point. But it's France, isn't it French? They're not going to poison it. We have to go in and get him. He's like a big bully. It's like trying to talk peace with a big bully. It's like if a bully says, I'm going to kick your ass, and you're like, I understand how you feel. No. A big bully is like three and a half feet tall. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah, he has big shoes, He's, like, he's a complete <laughs> psycho with, like, with his little stupid Roy Orbison glasses. and his, you, you, you know, Do you know how short you have to be to have a Napoleon complex in North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> that guy is... <laughs> he's, he's little. The oh. Provacier thing is, is part of it, but... Also, the fact that he's got nuclear weapons pointed at the United States. Okay, you know what I love, by the way? That's a good connection point. connection between him and Saddam Hussein. These guys are all bitching and moaning about, and all, the, all over the globe about how much we suck, America, you know? Yeah. They go to Saddam's house and his son's house, what do they find? Right. They found, was it Miller Light beer they found? Mm-hmm. Or, or uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon or something? I mean, they, they're some... Schlitz. Yeah, I think it was, Schlitz. It was Schlitz. <laughs> I think it was, these right guys old. are consumed by American <laughs> props, you know? Struggling to keep up with the quality of wisecracks from his fellow panelists, Leary makes another quip about anti-American dictators drinking U.S.-owned brands of alcohol, a premise that wasn't all that funny in the first place. This continuing inadequacy among his less famous peers is obviously becoming too much, and soon, Leary would lash out. Well, or maybe there's a non-violent way to solve the whole North Korea thing. Good thinking. They're no, they're asking for. A, well, there might be. They're asking for. Uh, for what? There's a non-violent way to, to solve the problem with the country that we hate that hates us. It's got weapons pointed at us. I don't think so. Fellow panelist Greg Giraldo begins setting up another joke superior to anything Leary is capable of contributing to the program, when all of a sudden Leary forgets that he's on a comedy show and attempts to challenge Giraldo to a political debate on the merits of war with nuclear-armed dictatorships. Though this derailed Giraldo's bit, he will soon dismantle Leary both comedically and intellectually. No, you're right. Like Russia, for example, that big Russian war. Uh, <laughs> there, there are things that, there, there are things that, uh, no, there, there are approaches. You have to be strong about it, but there are approaches. There are economic benefits that we're giving them in order to, for them to stop developing their weapons. I mean, I heard recently they agreed to stop, uh, stop building nukes if American women agree to get their nails done at least twice a week. <laughs> it's just something I read. That's a good point. This guy writes so many jokes before the show, it's not even funny. It's unbelievable. He's got a, he's got a pocket full of them. Yeah. Uh, Completely devastated by Geraldo's ironclad rebuttal that America has in fact de-escalated conflicts with hostile foreign powers without resorting to a hot war, Leary now attempts to undermine Geraldo's superior wit by observing that his jokes are only funnier because he writes them in advance. Ignoring the fact that the Russia remark that so profoundly embarrassed Leary only moments ago was clearly spontaneous. That's what that's, uh, that's I'm not good. saying they're not good, I'm just saying. <laughs> I know. It was right there. That's right. kind of what we do here, Dennis, yeah. I'm a comedy writer. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not 
coming back. You know That's what? it. I'm That's it. it. You're the guy in school that did all the homework and then asked if there was any more that needed to be done. <laughs> In the study of people losing verbal jousts, this is known as flapping your gums or filling dead air. Leary has just been put in his place twice in a row, has no comeback, but still feels the need to say something, anything, to show that he's still in the game. He resorts to projecting an unfavorable profile on Geraldo, in this instance, that of a teacher's pet. Notice that this doesn't make any sense contextually. Nothing Greg Geraldo has said or done during this segment has had any air of a sycophantic student trying to win favor with their teacher. In fact, quite the opposite. All Geraldo has been guilty of is refusing to lend Larry the level of deference he has come to expect, an approach that he will be doubling down on in the seconds to come. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point, and if you would try a little comedy writing, maybe your show would still be on the air. Oh! Oof. The only thing is, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm saying. Even my cup's half licking up. Yeah, the sanitation oh. guys like that show. They tell me all the time. Yeah, she said the sanitation guys. They what did they say about Dennis's they show? They love it. They said that Dennis's show should have never been taken off the air because it was the only, you know, sign yeah, of a real guy. Right? Dennis's show. Did you ever have a show? No. Oh, no. Oh, yes, you. he did. Moving on. He did. This is a microcosm <laughs> of why war will never end, right here. Right. No, I, we're no, 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 we're done. We're done. You started it, I'll finish it. I'm telling you, but it's a, it's a microcosm, and yes, it's the only I'm really glad you did this section over again. Yeah, I know. You said nothing. I'm really well, we'll cut out whatever you want. How's that? Yeah. Because you're the other one again. And just so you think you can just off. keep calling me on every joke and I'm not going to uh, hit back? This is really going to be a fist fight. That's I'm not kid. I like the show. I'm not even kidding. It was a good, good show. show. It was a funny show. The bottom line joke. is this. And the good thing is Lenny likes to break up fights, too. He's good at this. You'll see. Me, I can if fight. If they start yeah. swinging, it'll get ugly, you know? The, uh, the bottom line is this, folks. That's uh, going to be the egg to the uh, s segment, I guess. <laughs> Several years later, in 2010, Greg Giraldo would tragically pass away at the age of 44 due to an accidental overdose on prescription medication. He will always be remembered by his peers and fans as an outstanding comic who was taken far before his time, and as the sharp talker who put one of stand-up's great villains thoroughly in his place.